Okay, back with this matchless DC30. As you can see here, I have changed out the screen grid resistors from the one watt carbon composite 100 ohms to these two watt um, metal film 1Ks, which will reduce screen voltage and current and make the EL84s last a lot longer without negatively impacting tone. And the bias was too hot in the stock configuration. When the amp first came in with 120 volts come out of the wall, in full power mode, it was at 12.65 watts, which is pretty much ideal. But in half power mode, which is how the owner was using it, it was at 15.95 watts, and that's just too hot. And the chassis in this area was getting too hot to touch, which is why the acrylic or plastic face panel, panel is uh, all warped. I mean, this was getting nuclear hot. It still gets quite warm. My initial bias changes are uh, of limited success. I've got the stock 68 and 63 here that are connected at one end, but just disconnected at the other end. And I've got two Viché Dale, same brand and quality as the originals, 75 ohms here. And this is moving me in the right direction, but I'm not quite there yet. Right now, in full power mode, I'm at 11.96 uh, watts. So I think uh, that's this res resistor here. I think the 63, 62 ohms uh, of the stock is better there. So for full power mode, I'm going to go back to the stock resistor. The issue is this one here, which goes in series. So going from 68 to 75, uh, moved the low power uh, bias in the right direction. We're not there yet. Uh, so this resistor is going to go back to the stock, but this resistor, which will replace this one, needs to go up in value, but not a lot. And one of the issues is that large wattage resistors come in stepped values. It's not like I can say, okay, I need a 78.5. That's perfect. The math says that. Now I've got to go with what's available. So 75K, I'm sorry, 75 ohms, 82 ohms, et cetera, et cetera. And that's kind of the uh, balance that Mark Sampson was originally trying to find on these that, that Phil now with Matchless is, is replicating. But like I said in the first video, Mark Sampson in the 80s was designing these and wall voltages were a little bit lower than they are now. And the supply of EL84s was much greater in terms of quality then you could still get the old stuff, the really good military grade stuff. You can't really get that now unless you want to spend an arm and a leg. And uh, Phil weighed in on the last video, Phil Jameson, who built this amp. And he took issue with some of the things I said. And let me just say that if you're really questing after the ultimate tone and you don't mind having to change tubes a lot, then Phil's approach is fine. The amp will run extremely hot, and as you can see, the, the plastics will warp on the back panel. It gets very, very hot, and tubes won't last, but some people perceive that that is a certain sound that is worth the trade-off. The owner of this amp plays in church at low power mode, and he didn't even realize that his amp, when it first came in, was crippled by bad hum caused by bad preamp tubes. So... He's not the kind of player who wants to change tubes every six months. So I'm not neutering this amp. I'm not going to make this thing some wimpy thing. I'm reducing the screen current and the screen voltages. That's good for current production EL84s. It will still be operating within the range that vintage JMIs did, which is pretty much what Mark was chasing uh, with this model of Matchless when it came out. And uh, once I get this resistor chosen, then we're still going to be in the ideal bias range. Rather than going to 15 watts idle, which is too hot, or more, I've seen 19 in, in Matchless and Bad Cats and other similars, I want to have it so that regardless of whether it's in high power mode or low power mode, uh, the bias at idle is about 13, 14 watts. It's over 100% dissipation. You know, 100% dissipation for an EL84 is 12 watts. And part of the sound with, with boxes and Matchless and such is that you actually have it idle slightly above that, which means that when you're playing and it drops down in, in dissipation, it's an odd thing with cathode bias, you find yourself playing in the, the sweet spot of the tube's behavior. I'm not going to get too technical on that. If you bias it too cold, then when you play really hard, 
you get into crossover distortion and nasties. So Mark and Phil were doing the same thing, were chasing the same end goal that I am chasing with the Voxes and such that I work on. So I'm not at odds with them. And if uh, a pro player was using this in a studio and wanted to have it exactly right, I'd say, that's fine. I'll put those 100 ohm, one watt carbon comps back for you. That's not a problem. Use it with a Variac or some other regulated supply. Give it a very clean supply and uh, know that you will be changing tubes maybe every six months, maybe, maybe sooner. It will be hard on the tubes. It will be hard on the amp. But if that's the, the, the tone chase you're on, so be it, your choice. You have to know the choice that you're making. Uh, the owner of this amp was not in a position to make that choice. And uh, so I'm, I'm going for an increase in reliability, an increase in uh, the longevity of tubes without sacrificing the sound. And once I'm done with it, we'll get to hear it for real. But for right now... Tune, sorry, from the high gain testing the other day. And uh, I guess I'm clipping the hell out of the, the phone mic on this. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm using the lav mic. Duh. So that was the top boost channel from, say, a 63 AC30. Let's go to the EF86 channel. tune that a little bit more once the uh, bias is set exactly right. And again, that ticking that you hear is environmental. Will go away when it's shielded in the chassis. And I've got a couple of these little bulbs to replace. People ask what these bulbs are for. The uh, chassis has little square cutouts in the metal and the black uh, plastic front panel has got, um, uh, it's embossed from the front with clear behind it, which means that, say this one says volume, this light bulb makes that volume label glow on the front. And there'll be another one for the big mattress logo on the cab, and then the front indicator. So I've got quite a few little bulbs to replace to make this thing look the way it's supposed to, but that's what these bulbs here do. There are better ways to do it these days, but in 1980-whatever, uh, when Mark was doing these, it was a fine choice. Every guitar supply store in the world, you went in to get your strings, whatever, had these number 47 bulbs, and they last a good long while, and there's not really any huge current draw, so it doesn't affect the heater supply. So it's uh, probably something you need to change out every five years or so. No big whoop. I think it's a nice amp. I think it's a well-built amp. I think it's an over overbuilt amp as far as service goes. You know, like when this thing needs to be recapped, that's going to be a nightmare. Uh, let me show you one more thing before we stop here for the day. You ever play the game Operation? Well, each one of these screen grid resistors had to be very carefully desoldered and unwound. The leads unwrapped from around the terminal and from around the uh, pin two, sorry, pin nine of the tube sockets in this case. And those tube socket connections are relatively fragile. You can't put any force on them. And uh, I desoldered and unwrapped and removed each, each connection and uh, did the same thing at the solder, uh, at the pins on the tube without hurting anything, including removing the channel one and channel two effects loops, all their jacks, so I could access the, the resistors down here. 
And all that was very time consuming to do it right, to do it to the level of quality that Phil and the other guys at Magilis used when they built this. So there's a standard of quality that is set and a good tech maintains that. Now, Phil may disagree with me on my choice of screen grid resistors. That's almost an aesthetic choice. It's not um, anything about engineering at this point, but he cannot disagree with the way I installed it because I installed them the same way the originals were in there. And it's not a hack job. Now, this would have been very fast for me to do if I didn't care about the amp, the owner, and the legacy. I could have just snipped it right here and down at the socket and tack soldered a new uh, resistor right there and right there. No mechanical support. Would have taken maybe five minutes. N done. Next one. Give me my money, please. Go away, amp. I didn't want to do that. So this is built the same way it was originally. The issue being that it, when it comes time to replace a resistor, you've got to desolder, unwrap the leads. Now, I didn't do the full wraps that he did. Uh, I did 270 degrees. And I'm not going to get into mil spec versus beyond, uh, but I certainly honored the intent and it's just as mechanically secure. It just means that if these ever need to get changed, it will be a little bit less work than it was to change them the first time. So matchless, good amps, chasing perhaps some ultimate tone, which introduces longevity issues and the service eventually will be needed and will be a big pain in the butt. But that's, you know, 15, 20 years apart, typically. That's a generational service. So you make the judgment. I can only report on the pros and cons of things as they're built. Uh, the only real downside I see in this, uh, when this amp does need to be having the filter caps changed out, let me show you those. I mean, real, real problem. Uh, not every tech can change these out properly. You have to have someone very, very good. And you know, I humbly submit myself as one such, but I am far from the only tech capable of doing this level of work, of replacing these properly. If you live in the in an area where you don't have a really good, well-known, trusted tech, reach out to Phil and the guys at Matchless. They might be your best choice. Send it to them, let them do it for you. Or if you have a real good tech, he won't need any instructions, or she won't need any hand-holding. They'll look at this and say, okay, I know exactly what they did and why, and I can replicate that. Just know that that is not a 15-minute job. That's probably two hours just to change those caps properly.